Our interview this morning is with Dr. Robert Eugene Abels. Dr. Abels was born in Fort Worth, Texas, September of 1936. He served in the United States Air Force from October of 1962 through October, I'm sorry, October of 60 through October of 62. His highest rank attained was Captain 03. This interview was conducted at Burleson, Texas on Friday, February 24, 2011. My name is Dale Dexheimer. I am not related to Dr. Abels. Also in the room we have Milton Gibson and Gary Burton who are our videographers. This interview is conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress and for Operation Remember, City of Burleson, Texas. And with that little introduction, Dr. Abels, you can tell us your story, sir. Thank you, Dale. Well, I uh, always wanted to go to veterinary school. As a junior in high school, I decided I was going to be a veterinarian. So uh, my first year in college, I was in the ROTC because at that time, every young male had an obligation of eight years of service and it could be split among active duty and reserve duty. So I had planned to go through ROTC and go to the service and serve some time. But while I was in uh, uh, first year of college and I found that there was an Air Force Veterinary Corps which I could apply for without going through the college ROTC program. So I did. After one semester of ROTC, I dropped that and uh, my plans were to go and serve in the Air Force Veterinary Corps if I was selected. So that was my plan and uh, so I finished college at Texas A&M in 1960 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science and a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree. 1960 was a, a pretty eventful year for me. It was a busy year so because I graduated from college. Uh, I came back to Fort Worth and worked for the summer with a veterinarian here in Fort Worth. And in August of 1960, I got married to my wife, Eddie. And uh, in October, well, I was to leave to go to um, basic training in the uh, Air Force. So, but my wife was able to go with me, and so we went to Montgomery, Alabama to Gunner Air Force Base, and that's where I spent two months uh, with uh, learning to be a veterinary officer, and also learning what the duties of a veterinarian were in the Air Force. The Air Force at that time had a, a, a veterinary corps. Also, the Army had a veterinary corps, so you could go either to the Army or to the, the Air Force. So I went to the Air Force and learned to do all of the duties of a veterinarian uh, there in that two months uh, in uh, Alabama. Following that, we got our assignments, and I was assigned to McConnell Air Force Base, Wichita, Kansas, as the base veterinarian. We arrived there in uh, early December after leaving uh, um, Alabama and wasn't much going on in Wichita, Kansas in, in December. So uh, we did all the initial things of getting on the base and uh, learning what I was to do and meeting all of the people that uh, I was connected with. Um, veterinarians in the Air Force or in the Army are mainly involved with food service sanitation, health, and zoonosis. Zoonosis is the diseases of animals that can be transferred to people, either from either insects, bacteria, viruses, or diseases, rabies being one of the diseases that we were responsible for controlling. Um, so that's the general duties. We were at I was attached to the hospital medical group, 866 medical group there on McConnell Air Force Base. McConnell was a SAC base at that time. 
and it was involved in the Cold War in that it was a training base for combat crews for the B-47 B bomber, which were used at that time in high altitude training and bombing, and it was during the period of the Cold War. So there was a lot of preparation. Uh, it was at the time when there were the uh, uh, silos, the missile silos, which were generally located around most metropolitan areas. So that was another responsibility that we had was the health and sanitation of the silos and the food service that went to those uh, bases and those uh, people in, in the silos working. Um, you know, for every combat veteran, there's a lot of support people. And that generally was what my job was, was a support person uh, for the people being trained there at the base for combat crews. The work with animals was only two, day, two mornings a week on our base. We were given permission to treat the, and vaccinate the uh, service people, animals, and people that worked on the base two mornings a week. So we had a small animal clinic doing vaccinations and health exams and things of that nature. So, and that's part of the zoonosis, is to keep down uh, the zoonotic diseases transmitted from animals to people. Uh, most of our work was with sanitation. All of the vendors that came onto the base had to come to the veterinarian's office in order to get permission to unload and to have the, their delivery inspected. So that was one of our principal purposes. I had a a non-commissioned officer and two airmen that worked with me in uh, those duties. Another part of the veterinarian's job on a, on a base is to inspect the sanitation of all of the food facilities. Uh, the food facilities in the officers club, the non-commissioners officers club, all snack bars, all places where food is served, mess halls. So that was one of our routine things was to make those inspections. Uh, also the commissary was our responsibility to make sure that all food going to the commissary and being sold through the commissary was properly inspected, properly dated, uh, coded, and uh, sanitary. Uh, so that's the reason that everything coming on the base had to stop at the veterinary hospital. And most of it was going to the commissary. And uh, so because all of the families and airmen and officers did shop at the commissary. So we were very uh, active in working with the commissary on their foods. And many times we would have to reject food because it was either too close to being out of date, out of date or for some other reason. And we took samples uh, of the food and had them routinely uh, checked and inspected. I guess the most serious thing that happened on our base when I was in the service was uh, we had a food poisoning outbreak. One day I got a call from uh, the base hospital uh, uh, flight surgeon said, we've got a lot of airmen coming into the hospital sick with food poisoning. So it was my duty, along with the uh, public health director attached to the hospital, to find out what was going on. So um, we started going to every food facility, checking the past history in the last day or two to see what had happened. McConnell was a SAC base at that time, and the word got to SAC very quickly, and SAC was calling, says, what's happening down there? You know. Airmen are getting sick. What is this problem? Uh, of course, terrorism at that time wasn't a problem, but you would suspect it now as a method of terrorists to uh, weaken the uh, services. So we did our inspection. I had a very competent uh, sergeant uh, assigned to me, and he really did a lot of the legwork 
And what we found was that one of the mess halls had ham one day. Well, they kept the ham after they served it as sliced ham and made ham salad out of it. Well, obviously, some of it had been out of refrigeration too long and had developed some of the toxins. I believe it was a staph toxin at that time. And uh, so by mixing it with the mayonnaise and the other products, it began to incubate. And so they served it then in this mess hall. We located it by in inter interviewing the sick people, and they all had eaten it in one mess hall. So we pretty quickly isolated it. And so uh, we got that taken care of. We sent samples to the laboratory for uh, analysis, and that's where the food poisoning came from. But that's probably the most exciting and, and uh, thing that happened um, when I was there. Uh, it was a good time. Um, I learned a lot, and it was a good opportunity to be. Uh, my wife and I had always uh, had it was a good opportunity after being married such a short time to be away from home and establish uh, our family and. Uh, had one daughter that was born while we were in the service in McConnell. Um, we had a, we came back to Burleson after that, and we have a son also that was born here in Burleson. So we have two children. I didn't see an advantage of staying in the Air Force because my desire was always to practice medicine. Uh, so my, I spent my two years of active duty and then spent the other six years in inactive reserve. So it wasn't my desire to uh, stay in the Air Force and make a career of it. Um, that's about the main things about my uh, uh, time in service. Um, do you have some questions? I heard you had a little incident with the uh, non-commissioned officers. <laughs> yes, club. yes. Well, we all know that the non-commissioned officers are, are the backbone of any service. And it was also with my service there with uh, Sergeant Wood. But in, in making my inspections and rounds routinely of the food service facilities, uh, the NCO club was one of that got most of the write-ups. And it's a very busy club. And you know, the more volume you have, sometimes the, you slack up on some of the sanitation things. So uh, we had warned them and we had made inspections and repeat inspections. So it finally came to a point that one, one inspection, uh, it was just time to do something. So I closed the club down because of poor sanitation. And uh, it wasn't, didn't take but about 24 hours because they worked 24 hours around the clock. They called in every NCO they could get to come in and start sc scrubbing and cleaning and uh, removing stuff and litter and things of that nature and uh, getting rid of the, you know, in any food facility you have a lot of attraction for uh, insects. So it was getting rid of the insects and spraying and cleaning, just good sanitation. But they did a job and they called for a reinspection in about 24 hours. So I went back over at that time and uh, inspected with my sergeant. I took him with me. I felt that was uh, uh, a good idea to have a sergeant with me uh, because they weren't really happy because that's a very important part of the base was the NCO club and the officers club. But the officers club generally uh, they did a little bit better so we didn't have to close them up but that was one little conflict that did come out of, of my time in service. I guess I'm a little surprised uh, I would think they would have stewards or they would have a cleaning staff that uh, it wouldn't be the the NCOs themselves that would be responsible they would have some maybe contract labor to clean the club. Well, I think at that time it was generally like any restaurant. You know, they have people that do just cleaning, mm -hmm. then they have the cooks and the chefs and, and all of those. It's just like a commercial restaurant. Uh, but one of the things is, is 
finding time to clean out the coolers, clean out the refrigerators, uh, have them check that they're operating at the correct temperature. Uh, so many times uh, you put too much in a cooler and it can't cool properly mm -hmm. and the temperature then will drop. So it's everybody likes to do, the waitresses and the serving people and the bar people like to do their job, the uh, cooks and the uh, helpers in the kitchen like to do their job, but there's an area where that nobody likes to do and that is to take everything out of a cooler, clean the cooler, mm -hmm. and then put it back in properly. So I think that was just it. It was a busy op time and um, it was just neglect. And the, uh, and the manager of the club didn't oversee it quite properly. Didn't have the same problem in the enlisted man's club or, or at least not to the degree that you had to shut no. them down? No. And, and the, the O club was? Right. They, uh, they generally did a, a better job. But I, it may have been strictly volume to some extent. Busy place. Busy place. Just didn't have the time. That's right. Just a little bit of an aside. I, my experience, O clubs were just great places. The food was always really great. Yeah. It yeah. was inexpensive. Uh, when I was in Norfolk, I know we had people come to visit. We took them all to the O club, and you could get lobster and steak mm -hmm. and all that good yes. stuff, and it was just really cheap and and a the preparation was great, mm -hmm. but that's another story. Okay, uh, took your basic in Alabama, and you started, uh, I guess at A&M you were commissioned a second lieutenant? First lieutenant. You Went in as a first lieutenant. Because of the veterinary thing? Yes. Okay, so you're commissioned with a silver bar to send you off to basic in Alabama with a silver bar. Did you have to march? Yes. You did? We had to learn to march. We had to learn how to wear the uniform. Close uh, order drill and? Yes, and all of those things. And uh, uh, how to wear the uniform properly, which uniform to wear, and uh, um, how to salute, mm -hmm. you know, when you meet someone. Uh, all of the things, basically, that you they needed to know. And you did that for an hour or two hours in the morning, whatever, and then went off to class and they told you or taught yes. you these are the things that you should be doing yes. as a veterinary officer. Right. Okay. One of the things that they taught us was how to inspect oysters. We had to inspect oysters and sample them when they came on as fresh uh, food. And uh, there's an interesting thing there because they would ask you, said, now we're going to, today we're going to teach you how to inspect oysters, and you will eat them raw unless you have a religious prohibition of eating raw oysters. Well, some of our Jewish friends there certainly had the prohibition, but I did not at that time, so I uh, uh, had to go ahead and eat raw oysters. That's probably the first time I'd ever eaten raw oysters. I was going to ask if there were some people in the class who probably had not had that experience. Yes, and I was one of them. I had never eaten raw oysters. Growing uh, up in Fort Worth, it's not yes. the seafood capital That's of the correct. world, and even more so in 1960. That's correct, yes. How do you inspect an oyster? What well, do you, you look for? Well, you have to open it, and you have to smell it, and you have to taste it. Uh, you don't have to eat the whole thing because you can just touch it with your finger. Mostly it's smell because the fresher they are, the more of the fish smell they, you know, they won't have as much of the fish smell. But as they deteriorate, it gets more fishy. And so that's mainly it, looking for anything inside the oyster, which might be an infection or something like that. Never did find a pearl. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you, uh, when you were over there for your basic, did you take your wife with you? Yes. We moved to live Montgomery, on base? Alabama. Live on base or live off? No, we lived off base. Lived we had off. an apartment. Okay. Then you go up to McConnell. Uh, how were the winters at McConnell? Tough. Had you well, ever experienced anything like that? I had never experienced the amount of snow that they have there uh, in Texas. Uh, we learned to drive on snow pretty quickly. We moved in in December, 
and we lived off base. We didn't have right. base housing. So we found a nice apartment uh, close to the base. Uh, seemed to be really nice and everything. So we rented the apartment and uh, moved in. And uh, very quickly in the spring, when things begin to, weather began to get better, we found that this apartment was right in the, the landing uh, line of the air base. So these B-47s and sometimes B-52s would come over the house so low we could see the pilot's face. And at night, the, hit, the light, landing lights would shine through the bedroom window. <laughs> uh, and we found out that that's why, you know, there were so many apartments right in that area because we were in the landing path of the airplanes. And they were low. I mean, as low as I've ever seen a plane come over. And uh, they were the uh, B-47. I think there was three crewmen at, in that B-47, and you could see the pilot and the co-pilot, one behind the other, and uh, you could almost see their faces so close. Uh, as a first lieutenant with zero years, do you remember what uh, what the pay? Oh, gosh. I suppose you got something for, for the veterinary aspect? Well, yeah, there was something in that. I really don't, but it... You know, it was like $500 a month, something of that okay. nature. I think our, our apartment cost close to $100, you know. And uh, I know when I was discharged in October of um, 62, my mustering out pay was $512. And that's what I had to come back home. And I had a seven-month-old baby and a wife and at that time. But I suspect you were pretty well assured a job when you got back to Burleson. You had maintained the contacts and... Yeah. I had two choices, either to go to work for someone or to start my own practice. And uh, so it happened that a classmate of mine uh, in veterinary school had the year before, 1961, bought a practice in Burleson. And he called me. He knew I was getting out of the surface service, and we were very close in veterinary school. And uh, he called me and he said, look, I've got a practice I just bought, and I've got too much work for me. Would you come work with me? So I did. I came here. Uh, I got out in October the 15th, I believe, and I was here in Burleson by the 1st of November going to work. And didn't take that month and go to the Caribbean and no, land on the beach? No, didn't, didn't do that. We came and... We found a house under construction here in Burleson, and uh, so we purchased it, and um, I went right on to work. We did a little thing yesterday concerning city of Burleson. If memory serves, in 1960, the population was like 2,200. Correct. It so was under 3,000. Yeah, you came back to a 2,500-person town that That's right. has grown to 35,000, 36,000. Yeah. One red light two grocery stores. Uh, the red light was uh, down at Renfro and uh, 174. And Buddy's Market was right across the street. Uh, of course, the Bransom store was here, and those were our two gro Well, Mr. Scott had a grocery store over here in the Wood Shopping Center. Bransom's where it is today? No. No. No, okay. it was uh, right where uh, the... Um, you know where the barbecue place is and the Mexican restaurant is right here on Main Street, right facing the railroad track. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Um, I guess Eisenhower was, was president. president. Uh, I'm trying to think how that would relate to the military, Ike being five-star, et cetera, so... Uh, military would have been held in relatively high esteem. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And, okay. of course, the Cold War was going on. When I went in the service, uh, President Kennedy was elected president in 1960. Okay. And I recall that I was here in Burleson, outside of Burleson, on the day that President Kennedy was uh, assassinated. I was uh, testing a dairy herd over in, outside of Crowley, uh, for brucellosis mm -hmm. and uh, 
we had been working all day. It, it was an all-day job, and I heard it when we finished. Went to the car and turned on the radio. 1963. The uh, inspecting the commissaries. Your commissary at McConnell, or more than one commissary, had grocery sections. Mm -hmm. they, it was. Mm -hmm. We had only one commissary. Okay. It was pretty big. It had it groceries. Was a, a department store, the grocery. Yes. Everything all rolled into one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I guess they would have had butchers? Yes, they did have meat. They did have fresh meat coming in, and they did have butchers. Okay. Uh, you took specimens or samples from the commissary and some other places, had them checked for whatever little creatures, bugs that mm -hmm. you folks look for. Did you have your own lab? Yes, we did. We did. Okay. Some of the things we were able to test in our office. Uh, <clears throat> one in particular was uh, eggs, fresh eggs. Uh, and inspecting fresh eggs, when you, when you break an egg and put it in the pan, the higher the yellow part stands up, the fresher the egg. If you break an egg and the, fl and the yellow doesn't break, you know, and run out, it flattens out and it gets a little larger. So when it's very flat like a pancake, it's not as fresh as if it were standing up like a, a mound. And we had, uh, we were doing some tests at that time with micrometers. We had a little micrometer we would set over the egg and run the little uh, bar down to where it touched the top of the yolk. And so we knew how tall it was. <laughs> uh, idle binds. Uh, but you eat them. You don't may yep. not cook them. Let's see here. Uh, two days a week, you ran a small animal practice, yes. if you will, mm -hmm. for base personnel and mm -hmm. their animals. Uh, enlisted all the way to the base commander. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Base commander would have been a colonel? General. I think so, colonel. Colonel. He ever bring anything in? Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't the base commander, it, we had a division headquarters on there, uh, and so the division commander did bring his dog in quite a bit. And that's another story. Um, we would do blood tests for heartworms just make sure the animals were free of heartworms, give them the rabies shots and the distemper shots and wormings, and it was just kind of a lot of preventive medicine. But I tested the uh, division commander's dog for heartworms and found that it was, had heartworms. So uh, we weren't able to treat them at that time. So I had made friends with veterinarians in Wichita and uh, so I recommended they take the dog to one of the private clinics to have it treated for heartworms. The heartworm treatment in those days was very, very severe. It was using a, an arsenic preparation, which was very uh, sickening to the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, we have much better products nowadays. But anyway, the dog went there and he was treated and uh, I stayed in contact with the veterinarian and relayed information also to the to the owners and the dog did die and though they, they were very attached to this dog they the, the wife and every and the husband were very attached it was a black labrador and so uh, I thought well what have I done you know uh, sent their dog off to a veterinarian and the dog dies and everything so I thought well you know, but he was very kind. They were very appreciative and didn't extend my tour any because of it. <laughs> uh, your time in the military, are there two or three, a half a dozen people that, that you have some real vivid memory of some people? Do you, do you have any contact with any of those folks from... Were you the, well, let me start again. Were you the only veterinarian on the base? Yes, I was. You were? Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, Each base generally has one veterinarian. Okay. 
Okay. And is that one, true today yet? Air Force has done away with their veterinary corps. Okay. And I'm not sure about the Army. I think it would depend on the size of the base, uh, how many personnel are there, and how many different battalions or divisions or, or some segments are there. Uh, some of them would have to have a bigger staff than others. As the base vet, who would you actually report to or who would be your administrative commander? Uh, the flight surgeon on okay. the base. Second Air Force was in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. That was my next uh, supervisor. They had a, a uh, second Air Force veterinarian and he would come by to visit from time to time. And then above him would be the SAC uh, base in Omaha would be the base, the veterinarian for, for um, uh, the SAC. When you had this visit from the guy in Shreveport who was... He was a he colonel. Was a colonel. Was he a strong military person or was he kind of the, the older vet who came in to check and see how the kid was doing? Well, it was kind of that. He happened to be a graduate of Texas A&M also. Uh, Colonel Harnickle was his name, and um, he, was, he was really all Air Force. He was uh, uh, very steeped in the Air Force, and he made it a career. So he would come by to make sure that uh, inspections and reports and everything, and he did contact us immediately on the food uh, poisoning outbreak. So, uh, and he came by maybe twice a year and looked at the reports and the facilities and uh, so it was, we had a good rapport with him. Anyone in particular that you would remember on the base? Well, I think my tech sergeant was the one that gave me the most help. Have the same guy for two years? Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, sergeant Woods. He was a tech sergeant and he... Uh, he was a 20-year guy, I suppose? Yes, he was a career. I don't remember how long he had been in the service, but uh, he was very proficient and he knew how to take a young uh, officer and, and lead him by the hand and get him through, uh, tell me what needed to be done and how to do it. And I relied on him. I have not had any contact with him since and I left the base. If you had to procure something in a hurry, the sergeant could probably- He would do it. He could yes. find a way to get that done. Yes. You bet. Yep. Uh, We've done, uh, I don't know, 65, 68 of these things. And certainly you're the first base veterinarian. It's just interesting. You mentioned every guy in the field has so many support people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think these two would attest, uh, you take all of these little pieces and put them all together. It's, it's really quite a story. But we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. I appreciate uh, this time in the service and, and the time you took to come down and visit us this morning. Thank you. I appreciate it and thank you very much.